The end of the Age of the Reptiles has been debated since the 1920s. Darwinists speculate that dino DNA focused too much on girth and armour, evolving the giants into oblivion. Graduates suggest that massive volcanism, a result of the shift in tectonic plates, changed environmental conditions faster than the beast could adapt. Catastrophists have the most endorsed theory, believing that the impact of a large asteroid on Earth 66 million years ago released the energy of more than a billion atomic bombs and with it, the extinction of the dinosaurs. The sudden disappearance of these impressive beasts remains a mystery for the ages, inspiring scholars and artists, and in the case of one Knott's Berry Farm attraction, posits that sometimes it's art that imitates life. One unassuming week in 1986, Terry Van Gorder, president of Knott's Berry Farm, burst into Robin Hall's office with a stack of 20 books. On the top, a Time magazine cover hearkened the resurgence of a worldwide fascination. At the time, dinosaurs were a subject mostly found at museums or captured by Hollywood as kid stuff. Buck in that trend, Terry envisioned a thrilling and educational experience capable of exploiting the complex and fascinating nature of Dinosauria for the entire family. For Robin, the farm's director of design, it was a welcome change of pace from the rudimentary wayfinding that filled the docket since opening Camp Snoopy three years prior. Back in the 70s, Terry and Robin worked together at Magic Mountain, which was Robin's first gig after graduating from nearby Cal Arts. A cartoonist and illustrator, Robin eyed the dinosaur project as a chance to flex his narrative muscles. Their first idea was a walkthrough attraction called Dinosaur Gardens, slated to be built under Knott's Corkscrew. Guests would enter the facade of a museum, pass through exhibits about archaeology and paleontology before entering a workshop. The workshop opened to an exterior pathway through a Mesozoic forest. Creatures would scurry in the trees above, rustle in the brushes and pop out into view. Visitors followed the path through a bubbling tar pit into a steamy volcanic mountain occupied by more animatronic figures. Terry wanted to open Dinosaur Gardens the following summer. Well-known figure creator Dynamation was contracted to build the creatures. The unveiling of a new animated Dynamation creature represents the efforts of paleontologists, artists, engineers, and many others. The team members work together to ensure the accuracy of all Dynamation creatures. Dynamation was working through changes and with doubts about the short lead time, declined to provide Knott's a proposal. By December of 86, Robin and team were without a figure maker. Add to that hurdle the reduced guest control, inherit to a walkthrough attraction, and Dinosaur Gardens was dead on arrival. A week after scrapping Dinosaur Garden, Terry called a meeting with Robin and Knott's head of construction at the Berry Tales queue. Robin brought along project designer Lane Hauser, a graduate of Art Center and herself also an illustrator. Prior to the farm, Lane worked at Auto World in Flint, Michigan. Terry was adamant that Knott's opened a dinosaur attraction in the summer of 87, so he decided to use the existing Berry Tales track, vehicles, and envelope as a head start. The meeting moved into the ride space and Terry compelled the designers to pitch a ride story. Robin began with a premise inspired by classic monster B-movies, roping guests into a ridiculous plot about a scientist and his time machine. This would bridge the primeval scenes with the area's roaring 20s theme. Room by room, the meeting continued with Lane and Robin concocting a narrative of time travel through multiple geological periods. They walked the attraction, brainstorming details on the spot. The impromptu pitch took 45 minutes. Terry gave his designers the green light and five months to deliver. Immediately, Berry Tales was closed and its elaborate sets, props, and hundreds of animatronics were removed to storage and select pieces were later reused at the Berry Tales Playhouse.
the design and architectural department was already working on a refresh of Fiesta Village, so efficiency was critical. Lane had previous experience designing dark rides and led the creation of concept art. Knott's hired Fred Hope to build scale models of the uncanny realms for reference to the set builders and lighting designers. The animation was still out. Fortunately, Lane had a link to another figure maker, Sequoia Creative. Founded by Imagineers Dave Schweninger and Bob Gurr, the company made waves in 1984 with their massive King Kong animatronic for the Universal Studios Backlot Tour. With the added benefit of being located in Southern California, Sequoia was awarded a contract to build 21 figures based on maquettes that Robin crafted himself down on the farm. The five months deadline posed a tremendous challenge to the figure team. Typically, skins for animatronics are cast from full-scale body molds, but the hasten opening precluded mold making. Robin and Sequoia found a solution right under their feet. Robin remembered a material he used for flooring at Magic Mountain, with great flex and plasticity. Sequoia took the material and devised an experimental method called surface casting, in which the material was poured over foam, sculpted for texture, cured, peeled, and finally applied over the figure. As skins were cast, animatronic skeletons and mechanisms went into assembly. Crews worked feverishly to meet the deadline, adjusting and perfecting the show until minutes ahead of the grand opening on Memorial Day 1987. Over 16 million years ago, the most ferocious creatures the world has ever known mysteriously disappeared. To tease the marquee attraction, Knott's marketing department set a dino-shaped crate outside the park's front gate with the ride's logo and official name. The crate sported an animatronic tail wagging with likewise anticipation. Opening festivities included a parade of dancing cave dwellers followed by a press conference. After the panel, Snoopy ushered the media to the load station. Lane and Robin watched their critics board a ride barely finished but never tested. The press had no idea that the kingdom was having its first complete run-through. Visitors boarded ride vehicles at a Los Angeles trolley station. The mural of 1920s LA was painted by husband and wife team Laurie and Tom Gillian of Augusta, Montana. To the dismay of the design team and fans, the paste used to mount the old Berry Tales mural would not separate from the canvas and the artwork could not be saved. After a wrong turn, visitors found themselves in the middle of Professor Wells' laboratory. Though the inventor warns visitors to avoid it, the trolleys roll straight into the well-marked time machine. Early concepts in this scene included a cleaning lady that spun in cartoonish surprise and accidentally activated the time machine. Another idea had the professor at OBS with an errant hadrosaur. <laughs> Troublemakers. Lightning portals surrounded visitors, signaling a time jump. Visitors emerged in the age of early man, passing through caves to a Cro Magnon family. Wow. Boy, you can feel that breeze going through here now. This is the Ice Age. That's why it's cold. That must be the reason. In the late Pleistocene, the effects team lowered the temperature to 60 degrees Fahrenheit, a notable plunge on a hot summer's day. If that didn't send a chill up your spine, then the stare of a dire wolf might do the trick. Ice vanished in the temperate Piacensian, three and a half million years back. Here visitors encountered a giant sloth, saber-toothed tiger, and a pair of woolly mammoths. These figures were the product of a cadre of artists and technicians, including an engineer that had worked for the US government crafting experimental agricultural machinery. Matching adequate down pressure to keep the seed openers from bouncing is essential in maintaining accurate depth. However, it is more common for no-tillers to use too much down pressure than not enough. Too much down pressure can cause sidewall compaction, resulting in poor seedling growth. Correct adjustment of down pressure cannot be overemphasized. Above the unfortunate mammoth, effects controller Arts and Technology Inc. simulated an aurora borealis, the beautiful collision of electrons and thermosphere. At this point in Barry Tales, riders took a lift hill through the web-covered Thunder Cave. Making use of the extant tunnel, Robin and Laid surrounded visitors with creeping plants infested by oversized bugs. Oh, 
The foliage throughout was provided according to the fossil record by Lexington Scenery of North Hollywood, a company that is still around today servicing the film, television and theme park industries. Dimetrodon welcomed visitors to the Triassic. Trolleys veered into a swamp populated by Ornithomimus and Ornithosuchus. Kingdom of the Dinosaurs had an extraordinary musical score, written and produced by Kevin Nadeau of Knott's Entertainment Department. Paleontologists were consulted for the sounds of each creature, using an analyst of fossilized nasal cavities. Howling winds and tectonic rumbles complemented the oral experience, transporting visitors to an ill-fated paradise. Hey, a stegosaurus. Yeah, now, that's it. Steggy is my favorite. I mean, you hear it, you're tired of yeah. me talking about this, but I love Stegosaurus. I love him too. Good to see you. Uh, Same to you, pal. Good morning. Oh. Good evening. Leaping forward into the Cretaceous, a herd of Triceratops defended their young against the attack of a 15-foot-tall Tyrannosaurus Rex. The T-Rex figure was built in the San Fernando Valley, trucked to Buena Park, lifted by helicopter and finally lowered into the show building through a hole in the roof. The finishing paint and detail work was done by Lee Thomas, another former Imagineer best known as the revered visage of Madame Leota in the Haunted Mansion. A pteranodon circled overhead and visitors journeyed on, into a wood threatened by active volcanoes. Among the trees stood the ride's largest animatronic. Now, you call this an apatosaurus, Gary, but to me yeah. it's still a brontosaurus. It's still a brontosaurus to you, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. I'll right. stick up for you, buddy. Brontosaurus okay. is forever. Steam and heat pumps completed the fill of a world on the brink. A final time jump placed visitors in a cave haunted by a funeral troll. Bleached white bones foreshadowed the shared fate of ride and reality. After unload, visitors trekked downstairs to Dinosaur Digs, a shop decorated in the spirit of Dinosaur Garden's paleontology exhibit. For a time, paleontologists were on hand to share their expert knowledge. A lovely lady who answers those questions is with me right now, paleontologist Lisa. Lisa, what do you suppose, well, let me just ask you generically, with the thousands of kids who drop by here every day, what are some of the questions they would ask you? Well, I get asked a lot of questions about the size of the dinosaurs, what their habits were like, what colors they were. But probably the most frequent question I get asked is, why did the dinosaurs become extinct? And I tell them, well, that's just one question we're still trying to figure out the answer to. The Buffalo Nickel Arcade got in on the action too, with dino-themed coin ops. Knott's new adventure took less than half a year to build at a cost of $7 million. Crowds loved it. Robin and Lane spent much of opening day at the exit of the attraction, eavesdropping on guest conversations about the ride. In its opening year, Kingdom of the Dinosaurs presided over an attendance increase of 18%. A walk-around character was created to interact with park guests. The attraction would continue to appear in the park's promotional material for several years after. Knott's promoted Kingdom of the Dinosaurs with swag too. Dinosaur calendars free to every kid who visits this weekend. So grab your parents and go, because while the dinosaurs are here to stay, these calendars will soon be history. In short, Kingdom of the Dinosaurs was a hit. There was one problem that plagued the ride. Within the first year, some animatronic skins cracked and ruptured. Sequoia finished all repairs according to the contract, however the experimental method proved incapable of a long-term solution. Patching the skins resulted in lumpy, splotchy joints. After several layers of repairs, the formerly terrifying T-Rex puffed up like a child's toy. Some dinosaurs had to be exchanged with old-school, fully molded skin casts. The T-Rex alone was replaced three times. Nevertheless, Kingdom of the Dinosaurs was a fundamentally good ride with a complete story, a well-balanced lineup of characters, fantastic sound design, and at roughly seven minutes was neither too short or too long. Shockingly, in just 17 years, the kingdom would fall. We were, we were going to go to the zoo, and I said, what are we going to see in the zoo? And she said, zebras. And I said, yes. Bears, yes. She said, dinos. <laughs> Has she been reading the book? <laughs> <laughs> well, if she had been reading the book and she went to this particular theme park, that is what she'd see. This is um, sort of the classic story of man's experiment gone in a direction man never ever wanted it to go. 
I don't want to spill the beans, so why don't you tell me that the general plot? Well, the idea of it is that, is that um, people are going to make something that sounds like a, a, a terrific thing, a, a island that has recreated dinosaurs on it that people can go and see. And it certainly sounds, you know, at first blush like something I would like, and I think most people respond very favorably yeah. to it. And, and so part of why I was interested in the book was to take an idea that seemed like a good idea and show why it might not be a good idea. Dinomania went global with 1993's Jurassic Park. Universal Studios Hollywood wanted its piece of the frenzy and raised the curtain on Jurassic Park the Ride in 1996, only nine years after Kingdom of the Dinosaurs debuted. With more money, time, land and creative capacity, Universal's River Adventure was a truly excellent attraction, far surpassing what the farm could offer. A year after Jurassic Park the Ride hit the scene, Knott's changed ownership. Having seen plans for a grand revitalization, the Knott's grandchildren were inspired to cash in on the potential of Cordelia and Walter's land. They voted to sell the park, marketplace and the chicken dinner restaurant. Cedar had no experience operating a year-round park and took ownership of the farm with no specific plans. They agreed to the old farmer's passing wish that Independence Hall remain open and free to the public. No such requests were made about the other attractions. One year into ownership, Cedar Fair built Robin's design for a record-setting Woody, conforming to their national strategy that targets adrenaline-hungry youth. Robin parted ways from Knott's in 1999 and joined the creative team at Warner Brothers International Recreation. From there, he would branch out and work on museums, entertainment streets, malls and cultural attractions. Lane left several years earlier and worked as a key producer on Disney's MGM Studios' Twilight Zone Tower of Terror. Today, she is the vice president and creative director of Hilden, the historic residence built by Abraham Lincoln's son, Robert. Cedar Fair eliminated Knott's design and architectural department and with it any hope for new themed offerings. Supreme Scream, Perilous Plunge and Accelerator succeeded Ghost Rider, revealing Cedar Fair's limited playbook. Cedar Fair thought they could improve Kingdom of the Dinosaurs efficiency by grouping cars into trains and abandoning continuous loading. Trains stopped in the station for turnover, forcing the other trains to stop mid-ride. The interruption occurred because the park didn't upgrade the trolleys with a means to drop the rope, so to speak. To entertain the guests stuck inside, additional narration was added, conflicting with the conceit of time travel and ruining the ride experience. Your journey through time and now Ironically, the switch wrecked efficiency. Wait times went up, guess interest went down. Cedar dug a hole and found no bone. Introducing the biggest and baddest suspended coaster in the West. In 2004, Silver Bullet opened on the north side of Calico Square. A B&M inverted roller coaster, Silver Bullet takes thrill seekers through six inversions over two and a half minutes of track. It's a coaster that remains very popular and cost the park only one reflecting lake and two historic chapels. The same year Silver Bullet debuted, the reign of Knott's only dark ride ended. Why? Kingdom of the Dinosaurs DNA was ambitious supporting the largest and most sophisticated animatronics the farm had ever seen. But the operations team kept up with the demanding maintenance even as the park introduced new blockbusters. Gradual changes in the theme park landscape made it harder for Knott's Dinos to draw attention and compete. But the impact that ultimately doomed Kingdom of the Dinosaurs was the park's change of ownership. Kingdom of the Dinosaurs became a casualty of Cedar's creative learning curve. Unbelievably, Cedar Fair spurned the beloved attraction in plain sight, with no plans to use its space. The former headliner closed without fanfare and would sit abandoned for more than a decade. Scenery and animatronics left to rot. Lane and Robin's creations suffered the embarrassment of neglect, a fate undeserved. And then, in 2011, former Disneyland president Matt Oymet was named president of Cedar Fair Entertainment. What you do as a kid, you're more likely to do as an adult. So we're actually, I, I, I said earlier in a conversation you and I were having about uh, genetic vacation behavior, and that's exactly what it is. So when you do it as a five-year-old or a seven-year-old or a nine-year-old, 
you come back as a teen and then you're a young parent and you want to come back and share that memory with your kids. Umet had a neighborly fondness of Knott's Berry Farm and hired former farm employee Rafi Capralin as general manager. Together they engaged numerous projects to restore the luster of the historic theme park. Four years in, they set their sights on the KOD building. Oymet had commenced an initiative called Amusement Dark with the aim of creating next level dark ride experiences for the Cedar Fair parks. The first Amusement Dark attraction opened in 2014 at Canada's Wonderland, a hybrid steel coaster and 4D dark ride built inside Wonder Mountain. The following year, Knott's would debut Cedar's second entry of the initiative. Please welcome Bob Gurr. Is everybody excited? Well, you know, 61 years ago, I had a career that started at that other little park down the street. Um, and then later on, with Sequoia, as he mentioned, we got a chance to do another neat attraction here, along with the, you know, following fairy tales, was the Kingdom of the Dinosaurs. That was a very fast job, and had a lot of improvements over the year. So this is a very interesting facility that's now going to have its third wild show. But this show is very interesting because the interactive 4D type of show is a new level for knots. Opened in May of 2015, Voyage to the Iron Reef follows in the Knott's Berry Farm tradition of groundbreaking attractions anchored by nostalgia. The farm's most advanced ride, its story relies on the memories of past attractions. Several treasured rides are referenced throughout, one discreetly positioned trolley in particular. Kingdom of the Dinosaur scenery and figures were removed, yet not everything from the attraction disappeared. The Irish Elk and Direwolf migrated over to Timber Mountain and can still be seen today. Professor Wells moved the lap downstairs and continues his experiments. These days he seeks volunteers to fight time traveling robots. One would hope that the Gillian's mural is stored somewhere, perhaps alongside the sculpture of Rocco the Triceratops and a dinosaur egg or two. If art imitates life, then the fossils of this once magnificent attraction are out there, waiting to be uncovered. Kingdom of the Dinosaurs was the hit attraction of the summer of 1987 and proved that Knott's Berry Farm could do or be anything. Crafted at breakneck speed, it pioneered a dinosaur renaissance with scientific accuracy and a zeal for discovery. Despite extinction, the prehistoric dark ride looms large in the collective memory of an entire generation of fans, a champion in its time, unmatched in charm and ferocity. Long live Kingdom of the Dinosaurs. Thank you for joining us on our expedition to an extinct part of Knott's Berry Farm history. What did you think of Kingdom of the Dinosaurs? Was it great? Was it bad? Was it awesomely bad? Please share your stories in the comments below. If you've been enjoying this series, then I highly recommend picking up the latest edition of Knott's Preserve from Angel City Press. You can get 10% off your order by using discount code EXPEDITION. Click on the link in the video description and discover even more farm fresh history. A special thank you to our Patreon community, we really couldn't do this without you. Take a look if you would like to get early expedition releases and much more. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram to learn about upcoming episodes and we will see you next time.